Hi, uh, so this is part two of our set of notes from chapter two at Phase Diagrams of Pure Fluids. In the first set of notes, uh, so part one, we looked at reading PVT phase diagrams. So now here in chapter two, we're going to start to talk about ways to uh, predict um, those properties. So in this set of notes, we'll focus on corresponding states theory and uh, the Virial equation of state. Okay. And in the set of notes, we will mostly focus on uh, just talking about, or very briefly talking about, corresponding states theory and virial equation of state. In class, we'll actually solve some problems. Okay. So again, this is our uh, second part of notes from Chapter 2, Phase Diagrams of Pure Fluids, where we'll focus on corresponding states theory uh, and the virial equation of state. So where we ended our last set of notes was looking at uh, the Z versus P phase diagram, so a compressibility phase diagram. So if you remember from Thermo 1, uh, you should have been introduced to the equation of state for real fluids. Okay? And the equation of state for real fluids was PV equals ZRT. Okay? So Z is our compressibility, and Z accounts for deviations from ideal gas uh, behavior. Okay? So in the limit that Z goes to 1, we recover the ideal gas equation of state. So we say in the limit that z goes to 1, we approach ideal gas behavior. Okay? So then previously, we had mentioned that in the limit that p goes to 0, or v goes to infinity, we approach ideal gas behavior. So remember the idea being, in the limit that v goes to infinity, the intermolecular interaction distances between our molecules become so large that essentially the molecules can't see each other. Right? They don't interact. We have an ideal gas. So in the limit that p goes to 0 or v goes to infinity, z goes to 1. Okay, cool. So before we talk about corresponding states theory, I'm going to bring back a quote from chapter 1 uh, from uh, one of my favorite thermodynamicists, uh, John Prausnitz. Do the best work in thermodynamics that you possibly can and enjoy it thoroughly, but don't lose sight of the goal. Thermodynamics comes second. First comes chemical engineering. So remember, as chemical engineers, we are not interested in predicting, say, vapor pressure to 20 decimal places, something we can hold to be the absolute truth. Our goal is to um, design chemical processes, to uh, efficiently and effectively design chemical processes. So if I can't calculate vapor pressure to 20 decimal places, but I can calculate it to, say, 4, and not only calculate it but predict it, uh, then that's a fantastic accomplishment. And so the idea behind corresponding states theory is if we take our graph uh, Z versus P, okay, so essentially what uh, Pitzer uh, did or acknowledged, is if I take my plot of Z versus P, okay, and so um, I take it and I instead of plotting uh, Z versus P, but I plot in reduced coordinates. And so what I mean by reduced coordinates is uh, plot uh, with respect to uh, reduced pressure and reduced temperature. Okay, so plot my points as Z versus uh, P reduced, and instead of isotherms, uh, plot reduced isotherms. Okay, so my reduced temperature is just T over TC, and my reduced pressure is P over PC. So what Pitzer found is if he plotted in reduced coordinates, so here's a plot of Z versus reduced pressure, okay, and I have reduced isotherms plotted, is that for a variety of systems, he essentially achieved data collapse. Okay, so here's uh, six kind of uh, fairly ideal uh, types of systems. And if I look at, say, this isotherm, this is a reduced isotherm at a reduced temperature of 1.4, that while there isn't a perfect match, that the data seems pretty well uh, correlated with each other. Okay, you know, cool, that's great. Okay, so if we zoom in on it uh, on this next slide, so I plot Z versus reduced pressure, and I plot my reduced um, isotherms is reduced temperatures, you seem to get data collapse. Okay, you know, this is great. And so what that allows us is, is that if I'm modeling, or if there's a hundred possible fluids uh, that I could uh, have to model in a, a given process, it would be a real pain to say have to go and measure um, PVT behavior for all hundred of those fluids. What this suggests to us is that we could take, say, a fluid, maybe it's a reference fluid, we can model PVT phase behavior for that reference fluid, then take that data and express it or tabulate it 
in terms of these reduced coordinates. So rather than tabulating P, V, T, uh, Z data, we take it and we uh, divide everything by its uh, critical point. So instead of you know having P, T, and Z data tabulated, we plot or tabulate Z as a function of reduced temperature and reduced pressure. Okay. So then for any of those 100 fluids, if I know, so if I'm interested in a particular temperature and pressure, and I know the critical temperature and pressure, I can convert my actual coordinates to reduced coordinates, go to my table, get Z from that, and then I could use that to actually model and predict properties for my actual system via um, equation of state for real fluids. Okay, cool, great, right? All right, and so you have to appreciate, you know, the time savings that this could offer you, and then the power in terms of predictability that this could offer you. Okay. Okay. So this is two-parameter corresponding states theory. It's two-parameter corresponding states theory, and then I'm taking z, okay, and I'm plotting it with respect to two reduced coordinates. Okay. And so what we find is that this works okay for simple fluids, so noble gas types of fluids. Okay, and, or, you know, and, um, we could further say that this works for spherical and, and nonpolar molecules. Okay, so two parameter uh, corresponding states theory shows some promise. It shows promise and then if I plot things and reduce coordinates that I appear to get data collapse. Okay, so it gives us the correct uh, physical basis of, of corresponding states theory. Okay, but it's not as accurate as I might need it to be. Okay, and so uh, what happened, or what Pitzer did then, is if two-parameter corresponding states theory wasn't you know accurate enough for most applications, you know how I go from, or how I increase the accuracy is I go from a two-parameter corresponding states theory to three. Okay, and he introduces a new variable called omega. Okay, omega is called the eccentric factor. And it's defined as negative 1 minus log base 10 of the reduced saturation pressure at a reduced temperature of 0.7. How we came up with this magical quantity, I have no idea. And keep in mind, you know, a lot of this was done in the pre-computer days. Um, but nonetheless, this is what he came up with. Okay. So by introducing this third parameter, omega, we get a three-parameter corresponding states theory. And so while it's still limited in its applicability, it's much more applicable than two-parameter corresponding states theory. Okay? It's going to work well for simple, uh, normal, nonpolar molecules, uh, but polar molecules are still going to be uh, rather difficult. Okay? So this omega, again, okay, we call it the eccentric factor, so it accounts for uh, molecular shape and polarity. Okay? And how we can kind of picture this is... Our three parameter corresponding state theory is defined as z is equal to z naught plus omega z1. Okay, z naught and z1 are both functions of just our reduced temperature and pressure. So z naught and z1 are both expressed at, um, in terms of our two uh, reduced parameters. Okay. So z is equal to z naught plus omega z1. So the limit that omega goes to zero, this term goes away, and we're left with just z is equal to z naught. Okay. So how you could picture z naught is z naught is essentially the result of two-parameter corresponding states theory. Okay. So if I had no idea of what omega was, if I said omega is equal to zero, then this reduces to two-parameter corresponding states theory. So omega then, just like we mentioned here for a centric factor, okay. We said two-parameter corresponding states theory works well uh, for simple fluids. Okay, so the second term then here is going to account for deviations from this simple fluid limit. Okay, so omega right is meant to account for uh, molecular shape and polarity deviations from this spherical simple liquid limit. Okay, and what you'll find is when we actually go to use three-parameter corresponding state theory, if I were to look up say a centric factor for you know, very simple fluids, uh, it's going to be zero or very close to zero because this correction factor is going to be very small. The more non-ideal that component, uh, the greater omega is going to be. Okay, cool. So the Z1 term then, that's essentially multiplied by omega. Z1 is still a function of just our two reduced coordinates and we multiply it by omega. 
Okay, so Z0 and Z1 are both tabulated with respect to reduced temperature and pressure. And then omega is a pure component property uh, that's readily tabulated well and as well. And typically it's provided in handbooks along with uh, your critical properties. Okay, and so what this would look like is these are just snapshots of what's called the Lee Kessler tables. And these are provided on the, the course website. Uh, Lee Kessler just being the uh, famous people that tabulated the data uh, that would otherwise be graphed. Okay, and the journal idea is here's a snapshot of our table for Z0. So if I know, say, my reduced pressure and my reduced temperature, then I can just read off the value of Z0. And then same thing for Z1. Uh, if I know uh, my reduced pressure and my reduced temperature, then I can just read off the value of Z1. Okay, And then typically omega will be tabulated along with my critical properties. And so I'll have that, which I could use to go and calculate Z. Once I have Z, then I can go and plug Z in to my equation of state for real fluids, PV equals ZRT. Okay, so the trick is calculating Z. Okay, cool. So that's corresponding states theory. The, the last topic we'll talk about is virial equation of state. Okay, and so the virial equation of state is, you know, the only uh, physically or um, theoretically justifiable uh, equation of state that we'll talk about uh, in this course. Okay. So the virial equation of state, um, so we'll talk about its two forms. So he said Z is defined as PV over RT. So the first form of a virial equation of state is essentially a power series expansion of Z about P. So Z is one plus constant times P plus constant times P squared plus constant times P cubed and so on and so forth. Where that constant is a function of temperature. Okay, so the first form of the virial equation of state can be pictured as a power series expansion about p. So in the limit that p goes to zero, we're left with z equals one, which is in agreement with our ideal gas limit. The other form, so again, z is equal to pv over rt, okay, is a power series expansion with respect to one over v. Okay, the significance of one over v is v is my molar volume. So one over molar volume would give me a molar density. Okay, so you could think of it as being a power series expansion with respect to the molar density. So Z is equal to one plus V over V plus C over V squared plus D over V cubed and so on and so forth. So we approach the ideal gas limit and the limit that P goes to zero and V goes to infinity. So the limit that V goes infinity, these all terms, all these terms go to zero, and we're left with the correct limit that Z equals one. Okay, and so this form of the virial equation state is probably the more or most common form uh, that you'll see. And again, you know, I commented that the of all the equations of state that we'll see, the virial equation of state is the only uh, theoretically justifiable equation of state, and so you can actually derive it using uh, statistical mechanics. The two forms of the virial equation of state um, are going to be related to each other, and we'll show that on the next slide. Okay. So with the virial equation of state, so we said we can derive it from statistical mechanics in terms of this power series expansion about my uh, molar density. Okay, and in doing so, these constants, we call these our virial coefficients, actually have physical significance. Okay. So our B constant, our second virial coefficient, is going to account for two body interactions. Okay, and so what I mean by that is if I have uh, a box containing a bunch of molecules of, so let's see, so if I say I have a box of just water molecules, okay, so if I assume that all of those molecules interact in pairwise in a pairwise manner, so the total interaction of that system can be written as the sum of my binary interactions, so just one interacting with two one interacting with three, one interacting with four, and so on and so forth, but just two body interactions, right? The interaction of me with that other guy is independent of some sort of triangular three body interaction, okay? Um, then, you know, that's what's accounted for in this B term, okay? So my B term accounts for two body interactions, C term accounts for three body interactions, D accounts for four body interactions, and so on and so forth. Okay, so second virial coefficients are actually a very important quantity uh, physically. Uh, you can actually relate them via some x-ray diffraction data, 
uh, with some assumptions to try and characterize intermolecular interactions uh, in solution. Okay, uh, so you could keep you could take this sum out to infinity and keep an infinite number of uh, terms would be necessary to obtain a very precise number. Uh, but for most practical applications, uh, it's only useful uh, when the series converges quickly and we can use or get away with just using uh, one or two terms. Okay. All right, so we said that our uh, two equations are related to each other. So here's my power series expansion in P, power series expansion with respect to inverse V. Uh, so these constants, little b and big B, are related to each other. Uh, here is a relation there. And the last thing I'll uh, mention, or one of the last things I'll mention in terms of viewpoint of the virial equation of state truncated at the B term. So I take my power series expansion. So we said for most applications, it's only useful if we keep our second and third virial coefficient. So if we were to truncate this at term two, our second virial coefficient, one way to think of it is here I'm computing the first derivative. Okay, so if I compute the first derivative, uh, and evaluate at p equals zero, that gives me b, second derivative is zero, and so if I were to write a McLaren series expansion, so z is equal to z in the limit of p equals zero plus p dz dp at constant t p equals zero plus uh, second derivative uh, correctional term, right, this would be equal to zero, this would be equal to b, all right, and we get z is equal to one plus bp. So what this tells us, if we relate it to McLaren series expansion, is I could think of this as being a tangent to my curve uh, through the ideal gas limit. Okay, so uh, we're assuming that z, uh, we're approximating z via a straight line through uh, ideal gas limit. Okay, cool. So if we were to do the same thing with the other form, okay, you get z is equal to one plus bp is equal to one plus bp over rt. And so what's interesting is with some manipulation, we can get it in the final form that P times V minus B is equal to RT. So remember, um, ideal gas equation of state is equal to uh, PV equals RT, right? So this is P times V minus B is equal to RT. So this B term then is taking into account sort of this excluded volume uh, type of uh, effect, right? Cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then uh, in terms of uh, virial equation of state, uh, corresponding states theories exist for that. Okay, so if I take my virial equation of state, so this is uh, with uh, expansion with respect to P, um, so I can relate that to big B, big B being our constant in our expansion with respect to uh, one over V or molar density. I can rewrite it in this reduced form. So B hat PR over TR, uh, where B hat I can relate to uh, B, okay, B being my second virial coefficient, this term, uh, P, C, R, and T, C. And then correlations exist in terms of getting uh, B hat. Okay, so, uh, you know, if I know the critical temperature and my temperature of interest, I could calculate B naught and B1, okay. Then along with my eccentric factor, I could calculate B hat. Then once I have B hat and I know R, P, C, and T, C, I could use that to compute B. Then once I have B, I could bring it up into my um, truncated real equation. Okay, and that's the uh, end of the this um, part two of the set of notes. Um, and so in class, we'll work on some example problems where we uh, plug numbers in and we do some real calculations, and then we'll carry on our chapter two discussion in another set of notes.